We're on the beach at Seaside, Oregon. It's a beautiful day. We've got a big rainbow right behind me. And I'm just in a happy, good mood. I'm happy to be alive. It all started when I went to the Oregon coast with my son Jason. I'd never seen snow on a beach before. That day I read an obituary in the Los Angeles Times about a man from New Jersey who had died. A man who had saved 14,000 people on one boat voyage during the Korean War. I had never heard of this story or this man before. I searched on the internet and found articles were being written in newspapers all over the world about the death of this hero, Brother Marinus. I asked myself, who was this hero? Why had we not heard of him before? How could he be living as a monk all these years? I went to several bookstores, uh, but I was really surprised how there was very few books about the Korean War. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the bookstores had books on World War I, World War II, and then they had books on Vietnam and the Gulf Wars. Why no books on Korea? Then I found out that Korea was called the Forgotten War. Um, we were wondering if uh, you knew anything about the Korean War? No. No? What do I know? <laughs> it wasn't a war, it was a police action. What do you know about the Korean War? Nothing. Nothing? Hi. Hi. Uh, what do you know about the uh, Korean War? <laughs> okay, what do you know about the Korean War? Um, <laughs> I don't know. The Korean War. I don't know much about it, sorry. <laughs> Alright, do you know about the Korean War? What do I know about the Korean War? That's about what I know about the Korean War, okay? <laughs> Korean War. About the Korean War? Well, I was a baby when, they were, when the Korean War was going on. That's how much I know about it. Uh, well, I know my father was in the Korean War. He was in a place called Pork Chop Hill, and I saw the books that he's had, and uh, he's now passed, so I, unfortunately I don't know much more. Finally, I was able to get a copy of a book called Ship of Miracles. I read about this man named Leonard LaRue, also known as Brother Marinus. He was the captain of a merchant ship, the SS Meredith Victory. He and his small crew saved over 14,000 people on a single voyage. And a few years later, he became a monk in New Jersey. And I could not get the story out of my mind. I decided that I had to go learn about this man. It was snowing that day as we drove up to St. Paul's Abbey in New Jersey. St. Paul's Abbey is a Benedictine monastery located on 500 acres in Newton, New Jersey. It has a school, a retreat for monks to pray, and a large Christmas tree farm. It also has a nice gift shop. This gift shop was run by a monk known as Brother Marinus. Once upon a time, he was a captain of a merchant ship, but for the past 30 years, he ran this gift shop. As I looked at the grave of Brother Marinus, I thought of how one man could make such a difference to save so many people. Then I thought about how he had retreated to this little place to pray and to serve God in a gift shop 
in a monastery in New Jersey. So I contacted the uh, Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and talked to Dr. Jean Mansavage. I'm Jean Mansavage. I'm currently the Deputy Director of Archival Research for the Department of Defense. She said, however, there is another story that nobody has ever written a book about in 50 years since it happened, and it turned out to be the story of what I call the Ship of Miracles. In my process of doing the research, I contacted the Department of Transportation, the Maritime Administration, and their Public Affairs Department provided me a stash of primary documents on the Merchant Marine during the Korean War. They were the, they were the ones who had the files. And it was there that I came across the story of the Meredith Victory. A group of historians from all the service history offices. And we were sitting around a table and I remember telling them about, you know, just anecdotally about this story. And they didn't believe me. They couldn't believe that there were, they said, yeah, 1,400. I said, no, 14,000. And I showed them the fact sheet. There was bravery involved. There were airplanes and boats and trucks and jeeps uh, involved. There were families. It has something for everybody, this story. When I sat down at the computer keyboard, the first, the first words that came to my mind were the title. And I hadn't given any thought at all, and I found my fingers all of a sudden typing the words, Ship of Miracles. Risking their own lives, Captain LaRue and his crew, they knew that it was very possible that they weren't going to make it. But they saw those people on that shore, I mean, waiting you know, waist deep in freezing cold water just to get on the ship, just for an opportunity to save their lives. And they were willing to take the risk. And I think that says a lot about the best in those men who were willing to take that risk for the, those, those refugees. And I thought here was a story where they actually got a lot of those people out. And nobody in America seems to know about it. We stopped by the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. It was a remarkable sight. Like frozen soldiers in a frozen battle and in a frozen, forgotten war. Men of all colors and creeds. On 24 November, General Douglas MacArthur launches a major assault in the Western sector in a movement designed to end the war in Korea, barring full-scale intervention by the Chinese Communists. By 28 November, the Chinese Communists have again entered the fighting in far greater force than they did a month previously. This halts the UN general assault and drives UN troops back. To understand the story of the Korean War, one needs to understand the story of Chosen. Cold, cold, freezing, freezing, freezing weather, frostbite. Those who were shot and wounded and could not walk died. To a military person, Chosen ranks up there with Iwo Jima as one of the toughest, fiercest battles in American military history. You got one way in, you got one way out. You got the enemy on your front, you got the enemy on your right, you got the enemy on your left. The only place you don't have the enemy is in your rear. At the Changjin Reservoir, the men of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th Infantry Division find themselves trapped by 10 communist divisions. It was the coldest spot in the world. I'll never forget that first night out in, a, in the valley of the frozen chosen reservoir. And that walking that guard duty and that cold air hitting your face just chilled me to no end. I still think of it today. Nobody ever dreamed about that cold, you know. And I, weapons froze and stuck. They wouldn't fire, you know. I got frostbite and my feet uh, to this day have very little feeling in them. I guess that was the most horrifying fine time in my life because of the fact that it was uh, one of the first close encounter that I have had hand-to-hand -hand combat and that's not fun. By 20 December Chinese communists and regrouped North Koreans 
have driven UN forces to the 38th parallel in the West. From that moment in time until we got back to Hung Nam, it was sheer terror. And anybody that says that they're not afraid in combat is lying to you. In Korea, the only accomplishment I could make on that was that I locked up the reservoir and I walked out of the river. Well, the Chinese hit us on November 27th in, in mass. And uh, our, our general had built the, had the engineers scrape off a little landing strip here to fly out our wounded. Over 4,000 wounded were flown out of there in a seven day battle. Took a look out to see what was on the other side. And that's when I saw these Chinese coming down the hill and it was a mass, just the ants. Thousand of them. Thousand. Well, it's something that you never forget. And I hope I don't mess up. But when you see a man blowing apart, and the last thing a white man sees is your black face, he's screaming for a drink of water. You give him that water, and the last thing you see him is collapsing your arm. And you have to leave him there. After Chosen, the American and the United Nations forces found themselves surrounded by over 100,000 Chinese troops. MacArthur finally ordered a retreat of all men and equipment to the port city of Hung Nam on the northeast coast of Korea. The Marines have a bitter march ahead. It's 44 miles to Hung Nam. The road winds through some of the roughest fighting terrain in the world. In the history of the U.S. Marine Corps, this march will stand as one of its most valiant battles. Up until that time, we were fighting to survive, and we were fighting all the way and up the hillsides, and the Chinese were just bound determined that they were going to annihilate the 1st Marine Division as we fought our way up. At Hung Nam, preparations are underway for the largest amphibious evacuation in military history. Naval senior commander advised General Amman, there's no time. If you want to save your force, you better just get your soldiers and Marines out. But I think General Amman's uh, reply was, I came in like a soldier, and I'm going to go out like a soldier. Everything of military value in the cities of Ham Hung and Hung Nam is to be carried away or destroyed. Huge shipments of military equipment had poured into the area for weeks to supply the expected victory march to the Manchurian border. Now these supplies, sent here to support the whole 10th Corps, are piled up and carried out to the transports again. The Hung Nam evacuation entails the movement of 105,000 soldiers, 17,500 vehicles, and 350,000 tons of equipment. When you have to withdraw, it's always with mixed uh, feelings. And uh, we had known the exhilaration of the liberation of the North, and now we were witnessing the reincarceration of the North under the communist uh, regime. I think the whole plan of the evacuation was thrust on us unexpectedly. There wasn't any prior thinking through the thing. It was, boom, now we've got to go out. How do we do it? And the first thing we do is plan for ourselves to get out. And uh, you, you got the most difficult aspects of a withdrawal operation. Uh, Combined, that is a, a reverse amphibious landing and a, and a retrograde movement against overwhelming force because there was a, a large number of uh, Chinese units there. Then I heard about another hero, a man called Dr. Hyun. And then 
I realized that uh, the Chinese were really involved, so we had to get out of North Korea and uh, the problem of the refugees. We'll say that you were, that you influenced General Allman to make that decision. Uh, I, I think uh, it's not only, it was a mass effect, I think. I wanted the refugees to get out because many of them were my own friends, my own friends, parents and so on, and many of them my deceased father's friends, and many of them my mother's friends. My mother was very active in uh, Hamhung civic affairs and the Christian circles. Dr. Hyun is one of the, one of the heroes of the Hung Nam evacuation. Without his persistence, without his dedication, without his determination, it probably wouldn't have happened. The one single important Korean advisor was Dr. Hyun. So his word and the respect, the mutual respect between General Amin and Dr. Hyun were crucial to, to evacuate of one, almost 100,000, all ages, male and female, babies to very old people. At least several times I was able to do that, talk to General Amin personally and urging, urging him uh, that uh, the refugees should be saved. And then the problem of the refugees grew in our, and we were watching. We didn't think of it beforehand, and it grew to proportions that were astonishing to us. We didn't know there were that many North Koreans that didn't like the kind of government they were living under. He had an entree, and he used it to, to go around and circumvent the chain of command and just keep that subtle pressure on until General Allman finally said, well, let's do what we can, and that's all he needed. All he needed was, let's do what we can, and he translated that into, take them out. He was instrumental in convincing General Alman to uh, evacuate as many of the civilians as they could. So there was pressure from uh, 10th Corps, uh, General Alman, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, including General Forney, who was our amphibious expert, to be sure that we did not leave these refugees to, to a fate which would have been clearly uh, execution. So my father said, just leave everything. You dress two, three layers. <laughs> it was already cold. And then he just took some money, and my mother had some jewelry. So that's all. We had just walked. Young people, they don't understand what it is, the war. I'm too sad. We know it's a very hard time. Yeah, lots of help to the American people. Come today or the last die. Yeah, we cried. Yeah, they helped. We are. My country, people say you forgot everything. I'm so sorry, embarrassed too. And then I began to see a lot of, lot of uh, Korean, North Korean refugees, women and men, women sometimes were holding big uh, bag in the head and holding two hands, and the little child on the back carrying, and hundreds, hundreds of them walking. Toward the Hong Moving toward the south in heavy snow, there were hundreds of refugees, young and old, carrying heavy stuff on the back and the head, were following the South Korean army. Snow was coming heavy. I was watching for a while. I could not figure out why this happening so soon, only one week. Then. I end up with one of a South Korean military policemen who was handling a traffic. I asked the policeman, why you almighty South Korean army are moving toward the south so quickly? Young man, this is a military tactical reason. We are only retreating three days, then we are coming back. I trusted him. Everybody cried. Yes, everybody cried. Be scared. Yeah. Go to the harbor to 
to get onto the boat's ship. So we went there, we saw in the big harbor, and 100,000 refugees just uh, crowded, and uh, they were, many of them wear the white clothes, white color clothes, many children crying, and the jam-packed, and the, there was uh, many LSD-like ships with their door open, and then they 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 take it in, and then they transfer back and forth to the cargo ships, which much, much marine. Afraid that the communists were going to come in. Yes, the communists are killing the people. We got the sea, we got orders to open up our orders, and it was for Hong Kong. The, the Marath Victory was a World War II constructed cargo ship. She was about 450 feet in length captain of the Meredith Victor, he didn't ask permission to do what he was going to do. I mean, he decided it was the right thing to do, and he, and, and he did it. And I think it's a, you know, it's a great lesson of not waiting around to get permission sometimes when you know it's important to, to go ahead and take action, make something happen. He was exactly the right man in exactly the right place in exactly the right time. I do, in retrospect, feel that if it was any other man, he may not have even uh, agreed to take his ship in, much less be successful. The long lines of the people on the beach, as far as the eye could perceive, and to see them coming across the horizon to the beachhead, yearning for freedom with their only access, the sea, and our ship, the only means to provide them with that freedom. There was all kinds of refugees on the docks, you could see them. There was all kinds of people up for miles up the road. And um, they said, we're going to take refugees. A ship like that, believe me, is not equipped to take people. It's equipped to take cargo. They, they came out to the ship to talk to Captain LaRue and asked him if he would take refugees. And he said, sure, he, he takes them. And he, didn't, <clears throat> he didn't ask us as officers, you know, Dino or myself, that what we thought. He, he just made the decision and he said, we're taking refugees and that's it. Yeah. So it was our job to get them on board and uh, pack them away. We got up there, the mountains were absolutely covered with snow, freezing cold, the temperature was very low. And there was this minefield that had been cleared with a very narrow channel. It couldn't have been more than, I would guess, a hundred yards wide, maybe not quite so much. And my recollection is that they had marked it with little white fender type of things that you'd use on your motor yacht on the weekend. Uh, by all rules of logic, there was, there was no explanation for how they were able to, uh, to stage that miracle of transporting 14,000 North, North Korean refugees, people of the enemy, uh, on a on a ship that was designed to carry 12 passengers. How many refugees were there on that ship, do you know? The, all the stories that I have seen say roughly 14,000. I don't know if they had an exact head count. I do know that the number was five greater than whatever the head count was going in because there were five babies born on board. So uh, I opened the porthole and immediately it looked like spaghetti, all these arms stuck in there, you know, and they had cups. And I remember I filled one cup, that really started the stampede, and, it, and there was a hot water bottle, somebody had that, so I got that and I filled that up with water. Anything they had, and these people were desperate. But you know, it was just one little tiny group, a speck of all these people. Hunger is a pain. You have no idea until you experience it. It's hard to describe that and uh, to live without a food and sustenance. And the pain, I still remember that vividly. Four days, three days. As a child, even to miss one dinner is hard enough, you know, but four days without a food. Not because you're fasting for some other reasons, but because you don't have it, the pain becomes even greater. You could hear, hear the noise. And as you approach, you couldn't believe what you could see when they saw the masses of humanity uh, that was at the dock. You just couldn't believe your eyes. And then on top of that, you got to remember, it was winter. 
and it wasn't very nice weather up there. And I could, as you got near these people, you thought, God, these poor masses of people in this weather. That's probably the first time in history that so many enemy civilians were ever evacuated in the heat of a battle. So the last of them went out of there on Christmas Eve, and they call that a Christmas miracle. Over 190 ships were brought in to the Hung Nam Harbor. It was the largest amphibious evacuation in American military history. Did your fingers got cold? Yes, and the body is cold. The hand and the food is more cold. We make it this way. Mommy say, daddy say, yeah. I was hungry, frostbitten, cold, but most of all, I was so scared. Uh, and it was a small American merchant marine freighter, and they cleared out all five cargo holds and crammed, uh, almost with a shoehorn, 14,000 people. But you know, just think about it. You know, the, the food, you can, you can go a long way without food, but water, I don't see how they made it. I really don't. How do you, how do you tell your eight-year-old kid that he's, you don't have any water for him? They're tough. It was a moment when somebody was in a position to help and there were people who needed help. There's something about Americans that has that uh, humanitarian value. And uh, you know, in the scriptures it says, uh, we are indeed the brothers keepers. That the, uh, I think the, uh, because it's a Judeo-Christian influence of practicing what they believe. Uh, we didn't speak their language, they didn't speak ours, and, and uh, there was nothing we could do for them. We didn't have enough water, we didn't have food for them. But I didn't worry anything about it except just miss my family. I just wonder where they are now. That's all I worry. And I look all over the boat. If they are there, I couldn't find them. Well, I don't think we thought too much about that. You know, on deck we were concerned about getting in through the minefield and wondering just how far away the Chinese were <coughs> and um, wondering how fast we'd be able to get out if we had to get out if uh, somebody blew the whistle. And the Koreans on the dock, uh, to me, were that was what we were there for. That was the job. The problem was how are we going to get them aboard? Um, coming up uh, the single ladder, the gangway, as we called it, would have been difficult because a lot of them were very old, and some of them infirm and carrying bundles. Uh, didn't want to leave those poor people. You see people like that, that everything that they can carry, their whole life is there you know, on the pier with them. What are you going to do? Let them be captured? And so um, I think it's humanitarian instinct in the American serviceman that just didn't want that to happen. In the port area, you could hear the marine fighters, you could hear the napalm coming down. That night before, that, the, that cruiser, man, he showed the one end of that bay, like, like I said, you could through the flashes, you could see the earth moving. We'd fill each deck with people standing up, and then we would put the big steel hatch beams on that we covered then with the wooden hatch boards, and then we'd fill the next deck. So we'd fill the lower tween, the lower hold where it was empty, the lower tween deck, and then the upper tween deck. And we simply went down like an elevator. Okay, we started the lower hold. When the lower hold was full, this is the hard part. And we took the hatch beams, which are made of steel, put it over their heads and lifted the sockets and closed them up. Because we had to use the next deck, and there's only one way you can do it, is to close the hatch up, right? And we did the same thing, but the guys that got in first that thought they had it made, they would got wound up the wrong way because they were down at the bottom. And then when we finished filling all the decks, covering them over with the big steel pontoons on the main deck and putting the canvas over the top, um, we then filled the main deck, and you've seen the photos, the main deck looks like Times Square at New Year's Eve. We had two lines going, and looked at the various hatches, okay? And it, it was not as fast as you think, it took all night, and it, 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 people were getting tired. There was no confusion, there was no terror, there was no fear, there was no arguing. Everybody did exactly as they were asked. Secured the ship, got our orders did the same thing on our way out back to Pusso.
it was decided at a higher level that uh, uh, the port facility should be blown up. talked to uh, some of the officers on the ship about about that uh, five babies were born uh, they they all survived they were all among the 14,000 who were rescued uh, which and, and they changed the number they forced the number to be changed from 14,000 to 14,005 and uh, he told me that he was delivering the baby and he had that umbilical cord and he didn't know what to do with it and uh, he said there was some woman here, he said, I guess she'd call her a midwife now. And he handed her the scissors or whatever he had in his hand and he said she did the, snip, snip she did the rest <laughs> and he said he recruited her for the, uh, the rest or something. And then the, I had about four or five pregnant women, two or three give birth while aboard the ship, three. One actually gave birth when they first came aboard, I had to go number five hatch and the first baby was born in a hatch. But we were very, very lucky because like all towns and all people, in number five hatch there was a woman that probably had been a midwife or not because she knows what the heck she was doing. I didn't. I gave I brought down some towels and water and stuff, but she took over and I made sure I never lost track of her. I took her to the hospital with us. Because after the birth was given and the little baby girl, I would put her on a stretcher and then on a pallet and took her up and then we carried her into the hospital and I'm, well, while she was in the hospital she was a very happy person but we took that woman with us because there was some other people that were ready to give birth to babies and I had about four of them in there and uh, it worked out fine again. She was completely empty except this bit of cargo in number three lower hole which happened to be very volatile fuel type 55 gallon They cup. started little fires down the, down the below to try to keep warm. <laughs> and naturally, they didn't know what was in the drums. She said, you know, unbelievable. We were so lucky. You know, you try to tell them that you can't do that. You can't do that, you know. But I guess so some of them did. Some of that cooking pots with them, I think they even made themselves a meal. I don't know. Jet fuel water in that thing, and people were starting fires. You know, not knowing, not certainly not on purpose, but if they had any food, they were trying to cook or stay warm, and they're starting fires, and there's still jet fuel in some of the holds. It, it, it through a mined harbor, um, it, there was definitely a higher power watching out for that ship. You know, it's been 53 years. I, I don't think much about it anymore, but at first I did, yeah, at first I did. How lucky we were. How lucky we were. I think that two or three airplanes could have destroyed us. I think that one mind, forget about it. I mean, did Captain LaRue even know that other ships were squeezing refugees on? Did he know that he squeezed on twice as many as probably the next closest ship um, as measured by refugee cargo? I don't, I doubt that they knew very much of that. It was funny to realize that uh, here all these people was We've been over, we've destroyed their land, you know, and everything. Yet they want to go with us when we left. And it was something that had never happened before. Kids, you know, they're hanging on to their parents, they having the faintest idea what it is, but they never cried, you know, they were a very stoic group, weren't they? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Of course, maybe they'd been cried out, you know, of all they've been through. So they were busy enough without worrying about the Korean refugees, but uh, they were kind kind enough, they have a humanitarian spirit enough, because they don't, they don't have to rescue so many seas of uh, refugees, 100,000 people. They, they, they violated all the rules, you know, they loaded the ships uh, in a way that you don't normally load them. They were loaded. I remember watching one of them go out of the harbor thinking it'll never make the first term. It was down, down below its... Uh, One of them had 14,000 refugees. Yeah, incredible. The population crammed on those ships, desperate to get out. And you could understand it. Refugees and 14,000 in a one heavy evacuation. This is a miracle to me. And those 14,000 people 
wasn't for Dom General Arnold's decision to evacuate it, and not be on the standing by recommending him, those people could have been killed. I understood later to divert us. They didn't want us coming into a place where there were many civilians and lots of army. They were afraid of the plague, I believe. That was their main concern. We uh, received orders on arriving at the port of Pusan that there was no room. And this is Christmas Eve, December 24th, and uh, literally no room at the inn. And the army was very anxious to get rid of us. And they sailed us for an island just south of Pusan. And we received orders to, to disembark the Korean refugees at an island southwest of uh, Pusan called Koshido. But I think that when you save a bunch of people and a bunch of babies and a bunch of some new kids come into the world, I wonder what they're walking around today thinking, you know? Well, it, it, it allowed us to get our equipment out of there, the Army Marine equipment out of there, and, uh, and also to save 100,000 lives. Uh, and I think that's, uh, and it was a successful evacuation. And we didn't go out of there, you know, with a, uh, with a tail between our legs. We went out of there knowing we will be back. So you, so you had 14,000 people on the ship, so what, you know? <laughs> it was probably the loneliest Christmas I ever had, but it's still pretty good because there's nothing you could do. You know, there was nothing you could do. If you had a, a, a barrel of presents, you could give those little kids or something, or candy or something. We weren't prepared to do that sort of thing. Well, anybody who was in that particular position would have done that, should have done that, and nothing credit is necessary. <laughs> so it was the right thing to do. Yeah, the right thing to do. Yes. <laughs> That's the message, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the Maritime Administration said that it was a, the greatest rescue operation by a single ship. This is a direct quote: "The greatest rescue operation by a single ship in the history of mankind." Now, they didn't say in the history of the United States of America. They said the greatest rescue operation by a single ship in the history of mankind. I guess uh, even to this day, at Christmas time, I, uh, I get a little sentimental about it. Mm. I can't help that. And I'm even talking about it, I do. And I remember Christmas 1950. He had always been a religious man, and uh, when this happened, he started giving more thought to, to whether he wanted to enter the religious life. And sure enough, four years later, he entered the monastery in New Jersey, St. Paul's Abbey, and became a Benedictine monk. And he told me how he was in the hospital in Japan, and he looked at where someone gave him a pamphlet on vocation to different monasteries or communities of men and he looked and he saw Newton was near Philadelphia and that was his first contact with us. The experience affected him. It was a moving experience for him and he got terribly sick about two or three years afterwards and he was in a military hospital in Japan. You could tell that he was that type of a person, you know, real. I'd get a surprise once in a while and Paul would knock on my door and say let's go to Mass. I was Catholic. I'd have to go with him. The story is, is he'd go was he was uh, you know laid up in the hospital recovering and he, when he kind of reviewed his life and the, there's a hospital chaplain, an army chaplain came in and he, and he talked with him I guess and then afterwards he said brother asked him what order he belonged to and he said I'm a Benedictine and he went home to his hometown Philadelphia he went home for recover you know for recovery recuperation and he came up here thinking it was the closest monastery Benedictine monastery to Philadelphia and he liked it and so he went home and he resigned his um, captaincy in the merchant marine and the ship line he was working for and he came here 1954 brother Marinus at that time the, in the what do you say ship uh, captain of the ship of uh, a Meredith victory. Um, 
was a real Christian. He insists very much, real Christian, and he did well. And it is, you have to uh, show people this human history, humanitarian history. So I was, I had good impression from him. In 1958, the president of Korea recognized Captain LaRue and the crew of the Meredith Victory with a special presidential citation. Captain Leonard LaRue, now Brother Marinus, reluctantly agreed to accept his honor in person in New York City. Yes, and Brother Marinus didn't, uh, I'd say, no, no. I believe he was more or less pressured into taking it going to New York one time for a reward. And uh, then he, w when he was going as a uh, <coughs> professional man, as a captain of a ship, he was very uh, dressed very well, he, very specific about the shirt he wanted to wear, the shirt, white shirt and tie. And he, he was not a careless man, and in the uniform he was very conscientious to look his best. His first job up there in the monastery is running a gift shop. He set up a gift shop out in front of the, the monastery, and he, uh, he was, that was his job. And I was surprised when I, first time I went up to visit him, I walked into the gift shop, and there he was, you know, and he was surprised to see me, I guess, more so than I, he. And being that way, you could tell he was a different demeanor, you know, a different type of fellow, never spoke loudly. And if you did your job, you might have to discuss it a bit, but never any kind of harsh talk or anything like that. Very nice man. I learned that he had left the sea and joined the Benedictine order, which was a surprise, but not a shock. But uh, he was a merchant mariner and had sailed, oh, maybe 10 or 15 years and um, left the sea. I went with a group of American Korean War veterans and Bob Lunny from the Meredith Victory on a trip to Korea. We were invited guests to a special celebration of the opening of a new monument to the Hung Nam evacuation. Over 100,000 refugees were saved during the Hung Nam evacuation. Today, over one million people are the heirs to those refugees. An entire generation saved, saved by Americans who took the time.
watched the faces of the people at the celebration. They had come from all over the country and all over the world to recognize the humanitarian, heroic people who took the time to help rescue others, even in time of war. Time to rescue so many. Bob Lenny went directly to the children. He looked into their eyes and remembered the faces of those people on that ship so many Christmases ago. Today he laughed with the children. Some of them could be relatives of those people that he had saved. He always wonders. For her service during the Hung Nam evacuation, the SS Meredith Victory was given the Gallant Ship Award considered to be the highest achievement for a merchant ship. The Guinness Book of Records recently awarded the Meredith Victory the honor for achieving the greatest sea rescue in history. This made me think of Brother Marinus, a man who prayed to Mary, and a man who loved sunsets, who also saved a generation of people, and who now inspires so many others, inspires me to be more humanitarian, to help others, to serve.